Hi, this is Clay Christensen, and I want to welcome you to a podcast series we call The Disruptive Voice. In this podcast, we explore the theories that are featured in our course here at HBS, Building and Sustaining a Successful Enterprise. In each episode, we'll talk to alumni of our course and others who are trying to put these theories to use in their lives and in their organizations. It's great fun to hear from them, and I hope that you find these conversations inspiring and useful. Welcome to The Disruptive Voice. I'm Michael Horn. Thrilled to be back here hosting again. I'm the co-founder of the Clayton Christensen Institute and wrote a book with Clay called Disrupting Class about the future of education and really hypothesizing about how online learning specifically could transform the nation's K-12 through schools. And of course, we've been living in a time during the pandemic when online learning has come to the fore of many people's minds and done some interesting things in schooling. But today we get to learn from Tom Arnett, who's been a longtime researcher at the Clayton Christensen Institute, about exactly what changes are undergoing and how do they fit the model of theory that we've seen before? And what can theory tell us about how these developments in digital learning and the incorporation of new techniques into the K-12 schooling model might evolve and what it might look like many years from now as well? And so first, I'll just say, Tom, great to see you. Thanks so much for being here on the Disruptive Voice. Well, thank you, Michael. It's great to be with you. Great to be chatting. And for those that may not know, Michael is the one that brought me into the fold of the Institute. So it's much due to you that I'm here doing this work today. You've done great work all along. So it's certainly my pleasure and fortune. And that's a good place to start it. You know, you've been part of the Institute for, I think, seven years and change now, if my thinking is correct. And you obviously got to work with Clay a little bit see him in action, asking questions when we would all get together and try to beat up an issue and think, what is the theory telling us about this? And I'm just curious, before we dig into your latest research and what it can tell us about the future of online and digital learning in K-12 schools, in your mind, what made Clay such a powerful thinker and teacher and how did his ideas matter in the world of education? Well, let me say, I knew Clay through his writing before I knew him as a person. I'd read a bunch of his books before joining the Institute. And I found them just so enlightening, so insightful. I had been an economics major and a psychology minor in my undergrad program. And so I had a sense for social science, but Clay's theories just had a way of not just giving, you know, statistical insight around one little piece of a phenomena in the world, but really creating frameworks and theories that helped you make sense of how the world works in a way that I just had never found anywhere else. And I've wondered to myself, was that the fact that he didn't come through academia, that he had a career before coming to HBS that maybe helped him think differently, but he just had a different way of being able to see how the world works in a way that's just uncommon, I think. The other thing I'll mention too is Clay, I thought, did an incredible job illustrating what he was trying to do with stories that just made the principles and the theories much more sticky and memorable and relatable. And then the last thing I'll say, and this is where, you know, Michael, you spent a lot more time with Clay than I did, but I was in a few meetings with him over the years and met with him one-on-one a few times. And just, he was the real deal. He was genuine, just showed an incredible intellectual curiosity, but just also a sincerity for wanting to understand people and cared about people and know where they were coming from to better inform his understanding of the world. Yeah, there's no question about that. Who he came across as in public settings was entirely genuine. I totally agree. I'm curious as we start to dig into this topic, you did this huge survey And you've done three of them now, I think, of K-12 teachers and school leaders, district leaders around their use of not just technology, but new models of learning and new adaptations in the wake of the pandemic. And are they in person? Are they remote? Are they hybrid? Where do they see it going in the future? Their opinions on all this. So you've collected an enormous amount of data. And as Clay liked to always remind us, (laughs) data is always backward looking and only Uh convincingly so in, in the very distant past. So knowing that we're still in the middle of the sausage making, if you will, right, that there's still Mm -hmm. tremendous uncertainty. Before we dig into specifics, I'm just curious, top line, right? You've done all this survey research. Are you optimistic or are you pessimistic about the future of online learning coming out of this, given that, you know, I think it's fair to say, and I've written, a lot of people had a pretty bad experience with remote Mm -hmm. learning and the online learning and so forth. There's certainly some who had a positive one, but where are you in terms of your belief about digital learning in the future and what it will or won't do in schools? Are you optimistic or pessimistic? I guess I'd say, I think I'm realistic. I no, see okay. both <laughs> I see both some negatives and some positives coming out of what schools have been living through in the last year. 
on one hand, our survey data came through pretty strong that the dominant way in which most schools approached instruction last year was to try and broadcast conventional lessons online, which totally makes sense. And maybe we'll get into this a little bit later. It totally makes sense from like their RPPs, their business models, like why they would go that direction. But then in the free response part of the surveys, teachers were super, super frustrated. They said like, this just does not work. I can't make lessons that work both for kids in person and kids online at the same time. Or when I'm just teaching the kids online, like I've got cameras are turned off. I feel like I'm teaching into the void. Kids aren't showing up. They're not turning anything in. I can't hold them accountable. And I think so a lot of people had a really rough experience experience and are eager to get past that as soon as possible and get back to normal. Unfortunately, I think there is some throwing out the baby with the bathwater going on right now where states and districts are saying, this just shows that kids can't learn well online. We got to get away from online learning. When in reality, I think it's not an indictment of online learning. It's really an indictment of the way they were approaching online learning last year because we've seen other examples of online learning working great. In fact, in our survey, there was kind of a total polar opposite expression in those free responses from teachers where some hated it and others were like, actually, I got to know my students better and I found ways to better meet their individual needs. And it was because they were doing online instruction totally differently than that concurrent, you know, broadcast the conventional lesson approach. But I think the field right now isn't seeing that distinction. And so I think there's a fair amount of backlash and pushback against online learning right now on the whole. But at the same time, one of the positive trends we saw, again, in that survey data was that there's these pockets of teachers. Well, first of all, let me say, there's a lot of resources out there in the system now that weren't there before. You know, more schools are now one-to-one, more schools have better broadband, just better infrastructure. And all that kind of lays a foundation that you can't have good online learning without some of those foundational technologies and resources in place. So that's now there to enable more stuff in the future. But on top of that, you know, there were those pockets of teachers that found new resources that they'd never tried before and new ways to use those resources and found them beneficial. So on the whole, where I think there's going to be pushback against online learning because of all this, at the same time, there's been seeds planted now that I think are going to grow into something really interesting in the years to come as folks take things that they otherwise wouldn't have been exposed to and wouldn't have learned about absent the pandemic and run with those and develop those and share those with their colleagues into the future. It's fascinating to hear you talk about that juxtaposed dichotomy, if you will, of reactions and on-the-ground reality. Before I get into my questions, starting to lay out the theory behind this, I'm just curious, we have the benefit of having looked at your survey results, and I have the benefit of having read everything you've written about this and so forth. Our audience obviously has not. So are there any data points or findings that you think, gee, let me just make sure I ground everyone in what you found over the last three surveys, just so people have similar starting point before we dig into some of my theory questions about where this all might go? Yeah. Let me give some of the top line statistics. First of all, the experience that schools and teachers had last year was really mixed. And one of the questions we asked was like, what's been your dominant approach to instruction last year? And it divided kind of evenly into thirds, where a third said we were mostly remote last year, a third said we were mostly in person, and a third said we were mostly hybrid, which is where some students are in person, others are remote, or they're in person or remote at different times. So one thing that I just want to lay out there is that shows it wasn't just this uniform experience across the country. It varied quite a bit across different school systems. The second thing, and I've touched on this a little bit, but 79% of teachers that were using that hybrid approach said the way they did hybrid instruction was this concurrent model, or what's often referred to as Zoom and Room, where they had some kids remote, some kids in person, and they're teaching both at the same time. They've got a screen in front of them and a half full class of kids in front of them, and they're trying to work with both. 79%. And again, in the comments, like we just saw that that did not work well for most teachers. They felt like they couldn't be effective. They felt like it was overwhelming, just made the job really hard. And teaching is already a demanding job. But then the positive highlights I'll call out, one is that when we ask teachers about blended learning models, and I guess maybe for background for those who may not be super familiar with our research, Long before the pandemic, and Michael, you were the one that started this, the Institute's been studying the incorporation or integration of online learning into brick and mortar school settings. So it's got some overlap with this idea of hybrid, but it's not the same as hybrid. And blended learning that was happening before the pandemic was happening, I think, for very different reasons than the hybrid instruction we see now. So Michael, you and Heather Staker had documented these different models of blended learning. And so we asked about those in the survey to ask teachers, you know, are you using any of these? And it was definitely not a majority of teachers that use these models yet, but a substantial minority, around 30, 35% of teachers that have, have used these at one point or another. And we saw some real gains in some of the models, in particular, the one called flipped classroom, 
which is where teachers are taking their lectures and making those into video recordings that they can post online. Often they're using software that lets them embed questions and checks for understanding during the videos to make sure students are staying engaged with the videos. And the idea is then you offload that lecture-based content instruction to a video. And then when they come to class, you focus on projects and problem solving and small group instruction and not having to do whole class instruction. And we saw on that front, that grew from 12% of teachers saying they were using it to 20% last spring. And then we asked them, you know, do you plan to use this in the future? And 18% said they plan to use it in the future. So it's small, but I think substantial growth for that model. And then what we see is something that's probably in correspondence with that. We asked about a bunch of different online tools like systems for managing online instruction, video software like Zoom, and some of the tools that gain the most traction or the, the biggest jump from like who was using it before the pandemic to who plans to use it afterwards mm -hmm. were the tools you use for teachers to make their own online lessons and record their own online videos. And in the brief response of the survey, we had teachers commenting saying, this has solved that problem I've always had of class attendance where the kid misses class, how do I catch them up, right? Well, now they're saying it's easy now. I know how to make these online videos to share my material. I can just point kids to those videos. And it's now easier that when kids need to review, I can just point over the videos and say, go back and review or point over those online resources. So those, I think, are some of the biggest winners in terms of technologies out of this. And I'm really curious to see how that evolves over time. As teachers learn those tools, do they start to figure out how to do more flipped classroom approach? Do they start to figure out how to do master-based learning where kids are progressing not based on, hey, it's the week for unit two, but based on, hey, you're mastering content and you move forward as you show that you understand the material we're covering. The last thing I'll highlight is we surveyed both teachers and school and district administrators. And on the administrator side, one of the questions was about new programs that they've launched during the pandemic. And we saw a huge jump in the number of school systems that are offering virtual schools. So 11% of those administrators we surveyed said their school system had a virtual school before the pandemic. 41% said they were now offering one last spring. And then when we asked them, do you plan to keep this beyond COVID, 32% said yes. So, you know, that's almost triple growth in the number of school systems that are offering virtual schools. I think, again, going back to your question about, like, are you optimistic or pessimistic? I think I'm a little realistic about that one, too, and that I think those virtual schools could turn into really cool incubators of new models of instruction. And we've seen this in places like Colorado Springs and Salt Lake City, where they've taken virtual learning and made some really neat blended programs. At the same time, I'm also worried about the districts that are just going to prop these up as like band-aids, stock gap solutions, and they're just going to be really crummy virtual schools that are serving no one well, except maybe the kids who would otherwise just be out of school altogether. And that makes a lot of sense. And there's a lot to digest there and, and pick apart, which we'll get into in just a moment. It's funny hearing you say the Zoom room. I hadn't heard Zoom and room before. It makes me think of doom and gloom, uh, which, <laughs> you know, rhymes it, obviously very, very neatly. Yeah, I think uh, it was doom and gloom for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, I think it was. The other piece that was interesting was you were talking about the videos and having a repository of videos. And so I would add that to the infrastructure you cited in terms of mm -hmm. the one-to-one -one devices and the enhanced broadband, not just in the classroom, but in many people's homes mm -hmm. as this infrastructure in which to build. And it's interesting, I was facilitating conversations with executives recently of large companies that were talking about how they do their learning internally in their mm -hmm. companies. And they were sort of lamenting the fact that they didn't have better tools for training their employees where it was really personalized. And they were all saying, my teenagers are really good at jumping on YouTube <laughs> uh -huh. and just following the cookie crumbs to learn about whatever they want to learn about. And so personalized learning is in fact already here outside of the schooling system. <laughs> and so maybe we'll inch closer to that within. But I want to tee off something as we dig into this a little bit more, which is that one of the big phrases that people used about the pandemic relative to K-12 education was that it was disruptive. And I think that's unquestionably true in the classic use of the word disruptive. But as we think about the theory <laughs> application, there were plenty of people who also said, well, gee, this is a disruptive moment, implying that it was similar to the disruptive innovation that we had studied so much. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious your take. Is that true? Is, in fact, the pandemic itself represent some disruptive innovation to K-12 education? I think this is one of those unfortunate situations where, you know, when Clay picked the term disruptive, 
talk about the phenomena he was observing. This is an incredibly powerful term, but it's such a powerful term that lots of people want to use it for other things as well. Because, you know, the pandemic is not a disruptive innovation. And it hasn't necessarily, I think, catalyzed disruptive innovation either. I think at the beginning of the pandemic, there were lots of voices out there were saying, like, this is the moment when education gets transformed because everyone has to go online now and it's going to change everything. And I don't think we're seeing that. We're seeing folks crammed the incumbent solution, the incumbent instructional models into an online format out of necessity. But I will say, I think the pandemic created more pockets of non-consumption, more Hmm. people who didn't have access to the kind of solutions that they needed that were looking for something different. And it also created, I think, more, you know, when you think of like least demanding consumers that have access to the incumbent solution, but are willing to give up some of its features and benefits to get something that's more affordable, more simple, more customizable. I think we also saw a fair amount of that that's happening. I mean, I think of my family being in that category where my kids before the pandemic were in our neighborhood school. And I thought at times about like, huh, I wonder what it'd be like to put them in a virtual school. But it always just seemed risky. Like we're pulling them out of school. Who knows if this is going to work? Well, the pandemic hit and it's like, well, might as well. It's like, they're not going to miss anything by being in this. And we did. And we found that the customizability of them being in virtual school has had huge benefit that we think outweigh some of the losses of them not being in that structured learning environment at a physical campus. And, you know, we've had to customize it to our own degree and figure out how do we give them social interaction and things like that. But it's allowed for us to have much more deeper learning experiences, I think, with them because of the way that we can spend time on interesting topics and wrestle through them together. So I think anyway, to go back to your question, I think Mm -hmm. the pandemic has created those circumstances where there's more of the least demanding consumers in education who are trying different things. There's more non-consumption, people that need solutions that the incumbent system isn't offering. But the big tricky thing in education is like, how do those get funded and stay in themselves in the long term? Because in education, the funding doesn't flow through individual families' consumer choices. I mean, to a degree, there are families out there that are in private schooling, but most of the money in education is in the public system. And in the public system, most of that money is earmarked for conventional schools and conventional school models. And that change in funding isn't necessarily going to happen just because the pandemic created a bunch of headache for people. Yeah, it's an interesting question because this moment is pushed more and more on what's our definition of school or what's our definition of schooling. And in most statute, it's sort of assumed that it is defined by the four walls and the classroom and seat time and line of sight with a teacher who's right in front of you and so forth. But that assumption has been under some assault for a few decades now, and I think it's Mm -hmm. come under more so. It's interesting. I was reading Clark Gilbert's dissertation research. For those that don't know, Clark was one of Clay Christensen's doctoral students at Harvard and then was the president of BYU-Idaho and BYU Pathway Worldwide, among some other roles uh, that have been very interesting. He framed his research in terms of why do organizations sort of lock down when they see a threat as response to discontinuous change as opposed to disruptive change. And in some ways, I think that discontinuous word is a better word for what we We've seen during the pandemic, and it opens it up to your point for disruptive solutions, perhaps to take root or to grow. Mm -hmm. But discontinuous might be a better word from a technical point of view Mm -hmm. uh, in the literature. I think it paves the way neatly into the question, though, that I'm curious about, which is the other side of Clark's research, of course, was that if you stayed in this threat framing and tried to tackle this new thing coming up, this discontinuous change in an existing organization, it was really hard to do so because Mm -hmm. routine rigidity, he called it, or threat rigidity set in where you would just replicate the existing processes in effect of the organization and not really see it as an opportunity or do something new with this new opportunity. And I'm curious then against that backdrop, what have you seen on the ground in terms of how school systems, resources, processes, priorities, what we in Clay World call the RPPs of an organization, how have they affected their response to the pandemic? Well, it kind of fits the pattern that Clark Gilbert laid out in his research where school systems by and large have just tried to take their existing RPP and cram it into online learning, which I want to say, like, in fairness, I think is a totally rational thing to do. You know, you think back to last spring, the pandemic has really sprung on them. Like no one was anticipating having to close their buildings suddenly within a matter of weeks. I mean, for a lot of them, I think it was like they heard about it within two weeks, their buildings were closed. And then through summer 2020, there was some hope that maybe we'll be able to go back in person. And so there was a lot of uncertainty. And then when the fall came around, schools were like, nope, we're back into remote learning in the beginning. And they just didn't have a lot of time to really prepare and really set up. And so in that kind of a circumstance, it doesn't make rational sense to just throw out everything you've done in the past 
throw out all the solutions you've used before and try and invent something new from whole cloth. And so like, I think very rationally what they did was they said, let's try and preserve our existing structures as much as we can. You know, let's not mess with the master schedule. Let's still schedule students' days online the way that they would look during a regular school today. At the state level, there were also requirements around instructional minutes that were somewhat relaxed, but then I think got pushed back onto schools more and more. You know, that's how we count education historically is not what did you learn, but how many minutes of instruction did you get? So they stuck with, we've got to cover our minutes. We're going to keep our schedules. We're going to still assign students to classes where it's roughly 25 students with one teacher. We're not going to do new staffing models. And it was just, I think, purely a, a sense of like from where they were standing, it seemed like the most likely path to success is to try and keep everything that they've come to rely on in the past as much as possible. But as a result, we ended up with this concurrent or zoom in room approach to instruction that didn't work work well for a lot of teachers, didn't work well for a lot of students, because instead of rethinking, how can we use time differently? How can we leverage synchronous and asynchronous instruction to benefit students? They weren't thinking in those terms. They were just thinking of how do we keep the train moving as best we can in this new train that we're in now, and it kept the old system intact, more or less. Yeah. So I'm curious then, you've already alluded to the fact that that response plus the opening up of not just non-consumption, but also making it less risky for those who are overserved by traditional mm -hmm. schools, the least demanding families to move toward these disruptive models of K-12 education, things like virtual schools for your family or mm -hmm. micro schools, learning pods, things of that mm -hmm. nature. I'm curious that as we go back into some sort of I don't want to say normal, I don't know what the right word is, but some sort of balance over the months and certainly the next year or two, it would seem. How do you think the pandemic is going to ultimately affect those disruptive models of K-12 education? Will the folks that have moved to them and unquestionably seen their growth, do you think they're going to slide back into the traditional system, those traditional RPPs? Or do you think they will mm -hmm. say the taste of what we've gotten is mm -hmm. so valuable that we are unwilling to make the trade-off to give it up? I think it's going to vary from family to family, it's not to not to mix theories too much, but I think some of it depends on the job to be done to the family, right? Like if a family went to a micro school or a pod or a virtual school, I mean, virtual schools don't fit this, but like micro schools and pods, which were smaller cohorts of students coming together, doing online learning, but in a physical space together. You know, the families that went to that, if that was mainly solving for them the challenge of, I need a place for my kids to go during the day while I work, I think that those families are probably pretty likely to go back to the conventional system because running your own pod or paying for a private micro school is more expensive than sending your kid back to the school system that if you otherwise thought it was fine, it was just you're missing that custodial care for your kids during the day. I see those families going back. At the same time, we've seen stories of families that were thriving in these environments because I'll play out a couple of different types of scenarios. For some, it was like students with special learning needs that got served a lot better in their comfortable home environment, getting more individualized instruction than when they were in a school. Or students who were bullied or among Black families. There's been stories I've read of families that were like, you know, the system didn't work for our kids. And when school went online, we saw that system up close and personal because it was being broadcast into our home. Home, and we saw that our kids were doing a lot better and a lot happier being a bit removed from that system. So I think if that's what's driving families, I think those will be more likely to look for other solutions in things like pods and micro schools and virtual schooling. Let me jump in there just for a second. Do you think districts might pioneer some of these micro schools or virtual schools? Like you've already said that, you know, 41% have virtual schools right now, 32% say they will continue that, which mm -hmm. in and of itself is fascinating. We know a lot of districts stood up micro schools or learning pods last year in collaboration with other community organizations. Mm -hmm. We also know a lot of those are going away this year because they want them in person. Mm -hmm. But if this environment persists where families are saying, I I would like another option, right? And that's durable. Do you think districts might come out of their RPPs and set up those independent organizations to stand up some solutions that bring them back in the fold? And that'll create a more sustainable movement behind some of these disruptive innovations? I really think it's going to vary from district to district. And a lot of it just depends on the vision and the leadership of the people running the district and running those programs. 
there are school systems that see this as an opportunity. And I think there is a real opportunity. You take the idea of like the type of flexibility and individualized pacing and customized instructional pathways that kids can be on in a virtual school. You pair that with something like a learning hub, which some districts offered to cite again, some quick survey data. Learning hubs, when we asked the administrators about that, 11% said they were offering learning hubs last spring and 5% said they plan to keep offering them. So an idea like learning hubs paired with virtual schools to create something like a micro school, there's places where I think they have the vision and they're trying to figure out how do we do this differently. But to go back to some of Clay's theories and some of Clark Gilbert's research, effectively what I think school systems need to do is they need to create autonomous units. In fact, if I could say one thing to every school district in the country right now, it's that you have this opportunity to create an autonomous unit in our play world language to really pilot and design and develop a new model of schooling with these non-consumers. But unlike in other market contexts, you know, for IBM, if they didn't make an autonomous unit, they would have been out of business. For other companies that Clay Research, if they didn't respond with an autonomous unit, they would have just been disrupted and that would have been the end of the company. With school systems, if they don't create these autonomous units and have the vision for what they can become and push them in that direction, what happens? Well, they just keep doing what they've done in the past. Like the incumbent school system is not going to go away regardless of how people respond. And if there's a message that I could say to the field right now, it sees this opportunity. It's not going to be thrust upon you, but you really have an opportunity here if you can see it for that. That makes a ton of sense. I, I want to, as we wrap up our time together, I want to dig on another side of this equation, which is teachers and how the pandemic has affected teachers' jobs to be done, if you will. You've done some extensive research into why teachers adopt new learning models, research that occurred in pre-pandemic times. And I'm curious, what have you found in that research and how has the pandemic affected or impacted how teachers' perception of their jobs to be done is based on all that data that you've collected? Yeah. So to give a little background first on that research, this was, I think, 2018 when we did that study and we were interviewing teachers to find out what is your job to be done that leads you to adopt something like blended learning or something like project-based learning. Michael, I remember we sat together for a bunch of those interviews with Bob Mesta in Detroit. And the most common job was that teachers were saying, help me to engage and challenge my students in a way that's manageable, which in other words means I've figured out how to teach. I've been doing it for a while. I don't want to throw everything out that I've done in the past, but if you can give me tools that are easy for me to pick up and learn that help me just make my lessons a little bit better to help me bring in that kid who struggles to pay attention or help me take this concept that no one seems to really get the first time I go over it, help me help my class pick it up more quickly. If you can give me easy to adopt tools that help me do that, they were interested, but they weren't interested in rethinking everything about the way they did teaching. Now, in contrast to that, there was a smaller subset of teachers we interviewed that were in that space of help me rethink conventional instruction. I need a whole new model. But to me, what really stands out is the distinguishing circumstance that put teachers in that job to be done was that they had had experiences that led them to conclude on their own that conventional instruction was broken. I remember one high school algebra teacher we interviewed who said he was ready to become a truck driver. Like he was not that far from retirement, but he said, I think his words were soulless. Like teaching math felt soulless because kids were just coming in to his class, learning to memorize what he wrote on the board, regurgitate it on a test, and then forget about it. He's like, math is so much more interesting than this, but this is how we teach math. And it just, there's no passion in any of it. And so he was at this point where he's like, I'm either going to quit teaching or I've got to rethink how I do stuff. And that's what motivated him to you know, rethink his instruction and go to a very blended competency-based model. So I think right now we're in this circumstance where more and more teachers are frustrated. They found that just relying on conventional instruction has not worked well this last year. The question, though, is how do they respond to that frustration? I think there's some that are just buckling down and saying, like, hopefully the pandemic's over. And I've heard someone say that, you know, last year for teachers, it was a lot of anxiety. And this year feels a lot more like depression, that they're just feeling the sense of learned helplessness of like, this thing just keeps carrying on and I don't know how to get out of it. And as teachers get to that point, some of them are contemplating, do I retire early? Do I go find another profession? Can I hang in there for one more year? But at the same time, I think there's some teachers that are responding to that frustration and moving into that job of like, I've got to rethink instruction because the way I teach in my classroom or I've taught in the classroom that may have worked there just isn't working for remote or hybrid instruction. I want to say like, it's not every teacher that's responding that way, but I think there's more teachers feeling that frustration and moving into that job to be done because of it. And that that makes me optimistic. 
There's a nonprofit I've become a big fan of called Modern Classrooms Project, which was basically two teachers in DC that were struggling with that challenge of attendance and figured out how do we catch up our kids that are behind. This is before the pandemic. And they've turned their classroom into blended, master-based, self-directed learning. And they said, we've got this working really well. They first shared it with a bunch of other teachers in their building, then created a nonprofit where they're sharing it with teachers all over the country. And what I find inspiring is it's like a solution built by teachers for teachers that has this very specific model. If you're in that job of help me reinvent my instruction, they have a blueprint for you to follow to help you do that. And they've seen huge growth in the last year. And so again, I don't think it's every teacher that's in that job, but I think more and more teachers are finding themselves in that job and looking for new instructional models. And that's it's encouraging to me. Well, I think you've certainly painted a realistic portrait of where we are, as you said you would. But if I could summarize, I think, and this is sort of the test of, of how well you've taught me today, right? And so I'll do my best here. And then you can fill in a couple blanks as we wrap up our time together. But it sounds like because of schools, RPPs, they took a lot of the online digital learning and just sort of crammed it into the existing model. Not a lot of innovation, really just replication of their resources, processes, priorities, not a lot of imagination. And so for a large percentage of that, it's going to go back to the way it was. But for some schools where there were bigger pockets of non-consumption, least demanding consumers gravitating toward these new models, and some leaders that created some autonomous models, and some teachers who have been moved into this help me replace a broken instructional model, there's some wind at their backs, if you will. And so while that's not going to be a tidal wave that sweeps away the entire existing system, at the margins, and many of the margins, if you will, we're going to see some changes and some quite transformational ones that that, you know, 10, 20 years could develop into something much greater than what they look like today. How did I do? You encapsulated everything I said into a soundbite. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, any closing thoughts before we uh, wrap up? You know, I'd say the pandemic has been a really challenging time. And part of me has been trying to be careful of being sympathetic to how hard this is for teachers right now. I think they got a lot of praise way back in the spring of 2020 when families saw how hard it was to do schooling at home. But a lot of that positivity has evaporated and they've just been left with their own frustrations trying to navigate really tricky circumstances and frustrations from other people that are not happy with the situation either and sometimes pin the blame on teachers and educators. So this has been a really tricky time. But I hope that in spite of all of it, and in spite of just the broader global challenges that COVID has created for the whole world, but I think there's good things that are going to come out of this. And that, I guess, to maybe contradict what I said earlier, I'm optimistic about that, that there will be good that comes out of all this. Well, we'll take that note of optimism. And for those listening, Tom will be doing a fourth round of survey research shortly about where teachers and school systems are at this point in the pandemic. And so, Tom, once that research is out and you've distilled some of the conclusions, I hope you'll rejoin us on the podcast and share what you've learned, because I suspect a lot of listeners will be quite interested to know how their school system is likely to continue to develop and what theory can tell us about the future. But for those that can't wait, they just want to stay on top of all that you're learning and writing about and researching and so forth, where can they learn more to stay on top of the latest and greatest of what you're finding during this period? Well, I'd say the main place is go to our website. It's www.christiansoninstitute.org. And then at the top of the page, there's a little tab for our research. Click there and see all the latest stuff that we're putting out. And if you like it, sign up for our newsletter. Yeah, the newsletter is a great way to stay on top of all things that are being learned and documented and so forth. It's where I get a lot of my information. So I highly recommend folks check out that resource. And for everyone listening, thank you so much for joining us. Tom, thanks so much for hanging out with us on The Disruptive Voice, and we'll look forward to more to come. Thanks, Michael. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to us at Disruptive Voice. Until next time, good luck, everybody.